I bought my first motorcycle as soon as I got my license at 16, but I'd somehow never heard of ADV riding or the Transamerica Trail until I was in my mid-50s. Once I discovered both, I became immediately obsessed. I decided that my first big ADV trip would be the Trans-America Trail on a Honda CT125. I didn't know anything about Sam or his route, but after a few days of riding the tat, I found myself developing a one-sided relationship with Sam. I talked to him as I rode along. I came to recognize Sam's distinct style of route planning. I could tell when I'd made a wrong turn. I'd think, Sam wouldn't have put me on this. I started to understand that this was basically a guided tour of the wild, deep backcountry of America with Sam as my guide. He'd come up with a way to see and truly understand the real America of back roads and mom and pop stores far away from the interstate highways, the McDonald's, and the Walmarts that clog our everyday scenery. About halfway through, I came up with what I thought was a pretty good way to describe what Sam has accomplished in creating this epic route. I felt that Sam had written the greatest American novel with roads instead of words. And that truly describes what it's like to ride the tat. It's not just a series of dirt roads slapped together with a bit of slab in between, with the goal of getting you from the East Coast to the West Coast and points beyond. No, the destination is beside the point. The trip is truly like a novel, and while Sam provides the framework, the story is different for each and every rider. You'll come up against your own obstacles, you'll meet your own unforgettable characters, and you'll have many twists and turns along the way, both literally and figuratively. Every road Sam puts you on is intentional, and you can almost feel him over your shoulder pointing and saying, check that out. The decades of work and heart that went into creating and updating this route is almost unbelievable. This was the most epic adventure of my lifetime. My 25-day trip was life-changing, and I don't see how I can ever replicate it again. And I have Sam to thank for making it possible. When I was researching the Transamerica Trail, I couldn't find too much information out there about Sam. An article in The New Yorker, one in Car and Driver, and one short interview on YouTube from 14 years ago. I'll link all of those in the description. But I wanted to know more. While I was able to talk to Sam a few times on the phone after my trip to thank him, I dreamed about getting to spend some time with him and hear a bit of his story. I hope this interview will give you just a little bit of information about this living legend, the creator of the Transamerica Trail, Sam Carrero. Enjoy, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Sam. I'm Sam Carrero, creator of the Transamerica Trail, and uh, we're here today to give you a few basic facts of how this thing came about and what's going on. In 1985, I started having thoughts about riding off the pavement, off the interstate and off the highways. And I was living in central Mississippi and uh, my first dual sport motorcycle was a uh, XR600. No electric start or no anything. And this was long before GPS was popular. I started going out on weekends. I was living in rural Mississippi, which is very rural. We had a lot of dirt and gravel roads. And I went out on the weekend, just riding the dirt and gravel road and and seeing if I could put something together for a loop or a three hour ride or a half a day ride. And it turned out pretty good. And so I did that and I was living in a little town of Hollandale, Mississippi, which is about 60 miles from the Mississippi River and the Arkansas border. And I said, well, if I start going west with this thing, and I get to the Mississippi River, and I like it, then I'll see what happens. So I did that. It was probably, by the trail, it was probably 65 or 70 miles to the Mississippi River. So I said, well, I'm gonna order some Arkansas maps. So I contacted the Arkansas Department of Transportation and I ordered their county maps, which showed the gravel and dirt roads. And I had to buy about, I bought a bunch, I bought a hundred of them. Um, and so I started putting Arkansas together. And this was long before GPS. So I had to 
locate the trail and ride it and measure it to make sure that it wasn't anything blocking it, wasn't on any private land. I was all on public dirt and gravel roads before I could use it. Well, needless to say, I hit a lot of dead ends. And that took a long time to do that. So I finally worked Arkansas and worked Arkansas days and days and days. I was doing this on the weekends and my vacation. Uh, I was a practicing pharmacist, which I'm now retired. And uh, I finally got Arkansas done and I put it together. And then I had to build a road chart. I said, how are these people going to ride this? stay on my trail. So I said, I got to do a road chart. And I had no idea of what format to use for a road chart. So I started putting things together and I did four or five things and they wasn't working. And so I finally came up with a, with a uh, format that I liked for a road chart. And on today's road charts, each turn, each intersection, you'll have a map of the turn, you'll have the distance to the next turn, and you also, and today, you'll also have the GPS coordinates of that turn. So that worked out pretty good. And then I did Oklahoma, and a couple years later, I finished New Mexico, and got all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. It took me almost 10 years to do that. Well, I got that done and I had it and I didn't know what to do with it. I, I got a, a, a motorcycle magazine and I phoned the editor and I said, I want about a two inch spot in your magazine to put my Trans America Trail in. And he said, well, Tell me what it's about. And I told him. He said, sure, bring it, send it to me. And I'll put it in and I won't charge you anything. So that was my first public outgoing of the Trans America Trail. I can't recall the name of the magazine. And sorry to say, I don't have a copy of it. I would sure like to have that, that little piece right there. And lo and behold, I got a phone call from a man in New England wanting to ride my trail. And I said, oh, hell, <laughs> what am I going to do? I said, I had no intentions of selling it at that particular time. And he said, uh, can you give me maps? Of course, there was no GPS. He said, can you give me maps of the detailed trail? I said, yeah. And I didn't have any to give. So I scraped around and got him a set of maps and I didn't have no idea in the world what to charge him. And then he said, well, I'll send you X amount of dollars for all of these maps. I said, okay. And that was my first going public with the Trans America Trail. And he wrote it and word of mouth got out and word of mouth got out and it started growing. And uh, I didn't have a website then. So <clears throat> a year or two later, maybe a year later, I got a phone call from a young guy in New England that was in business school. He said, I'm graduating and I want to ride your trail for my graduation. He said, I don't have any money. But here's what I'll do. I'll build you a website if you give me the maps and everything and give me a set of tires. And I said, okay. So that, that happened. He built me a website and then it just started growing from that. It just grew and grew and grew. And I gradually added uh, states to it and made it better. And I gradually went back east and picked up uh, West Virginia, Virginia, and connected and finished Mississippi. 
And they had the whole thing, and it was right at 7,000 miles. And that's how it got started. Now it's around close to 10,000 miles, because I've added, uh, I've added, I've changed Idaho. I deleted Nevada, because it got, Nevada got so bad, um, I was so far in the outback that people was not living on these roads. And they got to be real muddy, I mean, real deep ruts and gullies. And the county stopped doing maintenance on these roads. And it got just about impossible. So I said, I got to change that. So I did a leader in Nevada, did a little work on Idaho, redid uh, Oregon. And I called that section the Pacific Ocean Spur because I wanted, in uh, Emmett, Idaho, the TAT turns back to the east. And my intention was to, to go all around the United States in one continuous loop. And I'm just about there. I like just a little bit to finish in that. In the early GPS days, when the GPS first started, um, the Corps of Engineers or the military, who it was, had a built-in error of about 35 or 40 foot given to the public. So if you had a GPS coordinate, you were actually 35 or 40 foot from that section. But soon after that, just very soon after that, they dropped that stipulation. Now you got a, like a 10 foot or a 15 foot error. You know, if you say you at this spot, well, the actual spot might be 10 foot away which is no big deal. So that GPS has changed it. Uh, GPS has caught on fire. I um, actually have more riders using GPS today, but the old diehard, the old population riders still like the maps and road charts. It makes them feel like they're part of the navigation instead of following just a line on the map. So it's six or one half a dozen the others. When I go out, I use both. I bring my map and I bring my GPS. And uh, that's kind of where, where it is today. And I've had some problems with people just using, just a few guys, not a lot of them, but a few guys just using a GPS unit will crash and destroy their GPS unit. And the ride's over. You know, that's, that's all they can do. So I think most of them have learned to kind of get a backup. Or well, have two GPS units in case one goes out. Or ride with a buddy, and a buddy has a GPS unit. So that's what it's boiled down to. My first thoughts was around 1985. It took me about 10 or 15 years to actually get it the way I wanted for the first basic to the Pacific Ocean. And now to do that extra, I've spent several more years doing that. Road charts takes a little work because at each turn, you got to zero your odometer. You got to get your odometer and zero it back to zero. Well, you can do it with a punch. So, and then you got to advance the road chart. But after 30 minutes or an hour, that it doesn't take you very long to do that. And it's a cookbook, you know, it's the, the road charts and the GPS are extremely accurate. If I tell you to go 0.25 and take a right, when you get to 0.25, that right's going to be there. Unless they bummed it out with atomic bomb or something. Same way with GPS. GPS is accurate. A little problem uh, that I've, that has popped up one particular place in, U in uh, Oklahoma, where I was using uh, an old bridge across the river. The bridge was probably a hundred years old. And to use the bridge, it gave me a, about a 15 mile beautiful gravel road on the other side. I said, well, I got to use that. So I put it in and lo and behold, two or three years later, the county comes in and condemns the bridge and closes it. So I'll call the Department of, Department of Transportation and say, what's the deal? Are you gonna fix it? 
Are you going to keep it closed or what? And they said, we're going to keep it closed. So I had to go out and reroute the whole thing around it. But if they had told me that they were going to fix it, I wouldn't have changed it. You would have to do your own little bypass around it, stuff like that. And then we've had local people to make changes on their own, which was forced by riders not being considerate of what the hell they were doing. Uh, there's a little section in Tennessee that comes to mind. Uh, it's probably three miles long, but the people that lived on that road got together, had a meeting, printed a sign and said, road closed to through, through traffic. So that was their own. Uh, and so, but I've changed that since then. And then there's a place in Tennessee <clears throat> where landowners have got together without the knowledge of the Department of Transportation and thing, and printed up signs saying, your GPS is in error, is wrong. Turn around and go back. So they put that up. But the road is perfectly, it's a, it's a public gravel named road. It's perfectly legal to do it. So stuff like that. But that's because riders don't respect what the heck they were doing. And uh, oh, there's one more place in Oklahoma. Um, when I was doing this, it's in the uh, the uh, Panhandle of Oklahoma. I found this found this little gravel road. It was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I looked at a map. It's about 15 miles long. And I said, "Well," and it was named and numbered. So I went down it, and I got to a house. His steps were about that far from the road. And he was sitting on the porch. And uh, I know his name, but I'm not going to give it. I might not mention it. And I got off my motorcycle and I told him what I was doing. And I said, I need your permission or your understanding to send some riders down this public road. And I said, I know it's that far from your steps or your house. How do you feel about that? And he said, as long as they stay on the road, and as long as they don't bother my cattle, it'll be fine. Come to find out he was a, a motocross rider. And he had a tack room. So he took me off and showed me all his tack and his, and his trophies and everything. Well, <laughs> that didn't turn out right. <laughs> there was riders going through there going out in his fields, doing donuts, chasing his cattle. And one day his daughter called me and told me what was going on. And I said, okay, I'm going to change it. I'm going to take you off the map and I'm going to reroute it. And if riders come through there now, they're not my riders. So I got you off of my, I got you off. So I got that settled. So this little things like that, it irritates you, you know. I have to reprint, I have to change the maps and reprint it, go in and change the GPS and re, and re, do, and re put it into the thing, take out the old, put in the new. It's, that's a couple of days, three or four days work just to do that. Uh, well, it's mom and pop. I'm, I don't have any, if you notice, I don't have any advertisement on that website. Nobody's paying me money to do that. And I put people on there. A lot of people from Oklahoma have emailed me and uh, asked me to put them on there. And this spot here is going to be put on there. Um, I do that and I don't charge them for it and I don't expect anything from them. So that's, that's just a mom and pop. It's turned out to be a good project. I've made a lot of, a lot, a lot of friends. And it's gotten 
gotten worldwide too. I have a lot of riders from Europe, from New England, from Australia, from New Zealand. I haven't had any known riders from China or Russia that, that I know of, but a lot of South America. So it's, it's been good. I made a lot of friends, made a few enemies. <laughs> That's a bunch of BS. I think they did not, that's, it wasn't intended to be done like that. It was intended for you just to see your country and see your countryside and who you live with and how they do things, you know? That's what it's for. And it takes, um, I have not ridden it in one continuous ride because I've never had 30 days to do it, but. That's coming up pretty soon. I'm going to retire pretty soon. And um, my son and I are going to do it. I hope so. That'll be fun. I've been fortunate. Most, most of the people that I have talked to that have read this have positive comments about it. There's a few of them that says, well, you got payment in here. Well, hell, you go 8,000 miles, you're gonna have payment. Uh, one story that's touching to me was a, uh, I got an email one day from my wife. She said, my husband is in depression. He's on the couch all day long doing nothing, just doing nothing. And I want to try to help him. So she said, I want you to send me the navigational stuff. I said, okay. And I sent them to her, I didn't charge her. And so she went out and she bought her husband a dual sport motorcycle. And she went in there and she said, here, there's a motorcycle in the garage, and he did it. And he wrote a book, and he stopped by my house several times. And that's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of real. Changed his life. I thought it would, for my personal benefit, I thought it'd be, it'd be very beneficial just to get off the darn interstate and get off the highways with the 18 wheelers and all that crazy people just to go out in the rural areas and stop at the mom and pop stores and maybe have lunch and a bologna sandwich you know and just see what's out there and that's what i've enjoyed about it you know well there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of stops that have gotten to be popular with the riders, uh, Oak, Arkansas, uh, that's a popular place. And since, since then, the owner of that thing has built, he's built uh, a little place like this, not just big, but a place like this, and he gives them uh, cell phone charging just for the TAT riders. And uh, there's people out there offer, there's one guy out there that offers uh, free camping in his yard, free ice water, and free use of his garage in case you need some welding, in case you need some work done. And um, I'm here with Homer in Corinth, Mississippi, and he, he's doing the same thing. He's got a place here for the riders. He's got a beautiful place here. It's fantastic. And um, so there's several places along there. Most of them are marked on the map, and most, not all of them are marked on the GPS, but they should be, but they haven't been on there yet. So, but that's kind of evolved like that. I've had guys ride in on a bicycle 
I've had a guy ride in on an electric motorcycle. I've had guys do it on horseback. And the Jeeps are getting popular too. The men have found that if they use their Jeeps, they can bring their family in, their wife and their kids. And it's now like a family vacation. So that's gotten to be popular too. I've seen some beautiful sections that were once a dirt Jeep, Jeep road, and now a paved highway. Yeah, that's gonna happen. I, 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 don't, I don't answer those questions. Uh, I get, I get one, of the, one of the most common questions I get is, Sam, I'm gonna start in Tennessee and I'm gonna ride to Oklahoma. What maps do I need? I don't answer that. <laughs> if you can't figure that out, you don't need to be riding, right? That's the way I feel about it. Let me tell you this, there's a lot of misinformation out there about the TAT. Some of these guys are ride the TAT and they'll find a little, little shortcut, something that's really nasty and gnarly, and they put it on, put it on tape and they are posted on the internet, Facebook, as riding the TAT, and it's not the TAT. They, they failed to mention that. So I get a lot of feedback on that. I do, I enjoy people coming by. Um, it's nice to, to get the input about what needs to be changed, what needs to be deleted, what, you know, stuff like that. I just try to make it a an enjoyable ride where you don't have to white knuckle all the way through it, you know. You know, like you said earlier, people, well, I did it in 14 days. Well, good for you. You know, and then I say, well, do you remember this? No, I don't remember that. <laughs> do you remember the switchbacks in Alabama? No, I don't remember that. You know. You know, when that first came out, I was really upside down about that. But actually, in one, let me, let me just back up just a little bit. In one particular way, that's helping me because I've, I've had numerous, numerous guys stop in my house using somebody else's route saying, Sam, we're having a hard time with this. And I said, what's your problem? I said, well, and they showed me and I said, well, you're not using the official route. And I take them in my office and I show them my official route. I said, you need to ride this. You know, you need to just try this. Load both of them up into GPS and just compare them. I mean, depends on what you want. If you want to bust your butt all day long, you ride that one, okay? And I've actually had guys to own the spot, buy my stuff, and ride mine. So it's, you know, it boils down to, to personal, what, what the rider wants. If he wants something, gnarly and hard and single track and you know stuff like that okay that's fine that's that's how i feel about it and uh, all these other little things that have branched up like back the back road to back county discovery routes and all that stuff a lot of that stuff ties in to my trail and that's a that's a boost to me I mean, that helps me because they say, we're going to ride this and then we're going to connect to the TAT and then we're going to ride the TAT for a while. Well, that's a boost for me. So it's, it's really a good thing.
First of all, I've got it. I bought a very detailed map. It happened as a dotted line on the map. And, uh, and it just so happens that it branched off from my original trail and 15 miles later, it came back in again. Well, I said, the only way to do that was to go out there and look at it. And it was in Tennessee. So I went out to Tennessee and I didn't have my motorcycle, but I was in my Tahoe. And I got to the junction, I said, oh man, that's pretty bad. <laughs> that's, that's pretty bad. So I was with a friend and the friend wanted to try it. So <laughs> I got in my Tahoe and I went down that thing and it was rough. It banged my Tahoe to hell and back. But anyway, now it's an option. When you get to that point on, on the map or the GPS, you're gonna have an option. And the option tells you that it's, it's muddy and rocky and deep. So if that's what you want, go for it. But if you take the other way, it, the other way it's beautiful. And one more thing, that dotted road deads in to the interstate. There's no ramp there. It's just a gravel road going up to the interstate. And when you get there, there's this stuff coming around this way at 65 and 70 miles an hour. And you're out in the middle of a curve and it's pretty dangerous. The reason was that that part you were uh, you were climbing elevation, and you went back around, and you came under the you were you, you came under the train track. The train track was that much you had about that much broom on each side to get through it. And I thought the jeep could do it. And I said, this would be nice, you know, because when you got through that, you had four or five miles of pavement. This would give them a little break. There's a lot of places like that. People will say, hey, why did he go down here? Why didn't, why did he stop? Why did he go down here? I want to go this way. Well, there's a reason I put you down there. I have ridden every inch of that transmitter trail to make sure that people coming behind me could enjoy it. Would I be an asshole by the police, uh, locals, or, but that has kind of changed because some riders are just not doing what they're supposed to do. That's a, that's a common problem. Most of the guys do it in sections. All right. Uh, say they won't do the whole thing. They start in West Virginia and maybe ride a week or 10 days and stop. Okay. And then go home. Now, they can, if that's the first of the summer, they can come back the last of the summer or the first of the fall and do a little more, or they come back next year and do the rest of it. I have a lot of that, a lot of that. And I've had people, uh, I've had a group in England that's ridden it three times. So that's, that says something for it. If you're riding the chat east to west, when you get to a little town called Emmett, Idaho, the TAT turns back east. The Pacific Ocean Spur takes you over to the Pacific Ocean. Now, when you turn back east, you got a whole new section of Idaho that's absolutely beautiful. A new section of Wyoming, South Dakota and Minnesota. All three of those states are absolutely beautiful. The state of Wyoming is probably 70% non-payment for the whole 800 miles. Unbelievable. Uh, South Dakota, you go right by the Mount Rushmore and you go through the Badlands and 
It's just beautiful. Minnesota is a lot of agricultural area. The thing about I loved about Minnesota was the counties keep those roads perfectly graded and hard packed. They gravel, but they're hard packed. And there's crops on both sides of the road, as far as you can see, for 100 miles. And, uh, and I, have, I have completed Indiana, and I completed Ohio, but I haven't added them onto my map. And then I like just a little bit up top, and then I'll have a whole loop around the United States. So you can start anywhere in that loop and ride and come back to your house. Now, we got Shadow of the Rockies to talk about. The Shadow of the Rockies connects the southern part of the TAT to the northern part of the TAT. Then you got the Shadow of the Rockies, New Mexico, which starts down in the border of Mexico and New Mexico. So you can go from New Mexico to Wyoming on the Shadow of the Rockies using part of the TAT. So that's added too. That's, that's gotten to be very popular because it's a, it's a, it's a 10 day loop right in that, that part of the country. And these guys can park in Trinidad, ride all that way and come back to Trinidad. The real reason behind the TAT is I wanted somewhere to ride my motorcycle. And I found it. And I wanted to share it. That's it. Hey, please like this video if you liked this video, and if you'd like to see more, hit that subscribe button and the alert bell. Also, if you're interested, there are links to gear lists and goofy t-shirts in the description. Thanks a ton for watching.